I would like to take the floor again to introduce... Oh yes, an applause is absolutely vetted for the next speaker, I can tell you that. John Gransfeld is a veteran, not just of space, but also to our Humans to Mars Summit. We are happy and proud that John graces our conference once again with his presence. John is one of my heroes, as he saved my Hubble. Well, not really just my Hubble, of course, but you know, you got it. Our Hubble Space Telescope, not just once, but three times. Did you know, John, that you thought me, a non, that you taught me something? Me, a non-astronaut, a really good life hack. I call it pulling a John Gransfeld. And if I say that, all my colleagues understand what I'm saying, because what I'm saying then, what I mean, is that the task at hand is all that I'm concentrating on. You know, so you have to do something, and there's a lot of other things you also have to do. Pull a John Gransfeld. Just see that one tiny bit of the tasks, of the list of tasks you have to do, do that first, then the next thing, and the next thing. Don't think about the list, just about what's right in front of you. And you'll get things done. You'll probably, you know, save your blood pressure quite a bit. And it's, it's just the way to do things. So, step by step. How did he teach me that? Well, you know, that's how John did the last Hubble Space Telescopes. And even all his astronaut buddies talk with all about how he managed that. I think it were 80 screws you had to take off the panel, these tiny screws, and you have this spacesuit with these, you know, you these big gloves, and you have to do them, you know, in a certain set of time, and you have to do it carefully. John just took them one by one, steady as it went, did a perfect job, and, you know, I think he screwed them on again as well, which even is double. It's clear that John is really a good man to have around when you are planning on doing a hard thing, like putting humans on Mars. So I give the floor to John to tell us. All right, so I'll make this interactive. How, how do you take out tiny screws in space? One by one. With a tiny screwdriver, of course. <laughs> Anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, wonderful to be able to keep Hubble operating, and Hubble is doing extraordinary. And so, of course, I always have to show a, a, a picture of Hubble. But Chris asked me to, uh, whoop, he's gone, to uh, to take us all. There he is in the back, to uh, to kind of wrap this up and take us home. So I thought I would. Uh, I'm still employed by NASA for another week. To, this afternoon is my actually uh, associate administrator retirement party, uh, and so this is still my official NASA talk. Maybe next year I'll give a different talk, but it won't be much different because our mission, and this is the way I think about it at NASA, is to innovate, explore, discover, and inspire. And I think we've heard elements of all of this at the Humans to Mars conference this week. From the science point of view, NASA is trying to answer some pretty big scientific questions. Where did we come from? Uh, Bill Nye posited we might be Martians. It's possible. Where are we going? I think we all agree we're going to Mars. But where are we going is, is a bigger question. It's also a cosmological question. It's about the trajectory of planet Earth. Where are we going on planet Earth? And I think we would all agree we're going to Mars. And then the question that really fascinates me today is the question of are we alone in the universe? And I, from a scientific point of view, uh, this is an answerable question. We can go to Mars. We can see if there was ancient life, if there's extant life. We can go to Europa and see if in the oceans of Europa or Enceladus, whether there's life, probably microbial life, uh, and we're planning to do those things. And we can look at the atmospheres of planets around nearby stars and see if we see any signs of life. Um, but Mars is the next place that we can go to look for signs of ancient life. And Mars, as we all know, is really a unique planet in our solar system in that other than Earth, Mars is really the only planet uh, where we think uh, we can live independently, where we can have a self-sustaining uh, population that can live off the land. It's enough like Earth that it has all the elements that we need. Um, and it's not very far away. How lucky are we to have a solar system uh, with a planet so close that it has all the necessary ingredients? One thing that we often forget, especially at conferences that are humans to Mars, that we are on Mars today. 
And all scientific exploration, all robotic exploration is human exploration. And so this is one of the most recent selfies. This is an actual photograph uh, of the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And if you look carefully, you can see that the uh, robotic arm has been carefully pasted out because that's the selfie stick uh, that took this, this actually mosaic of images. Um, but we are on Mars today and we are exploring Mars and we're learning extraordinary things about Mars. Uh, here in Gale Crater, you know, we've established that Mars was once habitable to life as we know it. If we had injected uh, Earth microbes 3.8 billion years ago into Gale Crater, it would have landed possibly in a river, possibly in a freshwater lake. And we are now reading the stratigraphy, reading this geologic record to understand the conditions uh, and try and find out what happened to that water. But Mars was a happening place. It had clouds, it had a thick atmosphere, it had a hydrologic cycle, rain, probably had snow-capped peaks. We know it had rivers coming down and streams, and we've been w driving over river deltas. It's a phenomenal environment. Um, and 3.8 billion years ago is about the time uh, when Mars was habitable that life started on Earth. And so we could be Martians, or Martians could be Earthlings if we find Martians, but we, we probably need to get there to find out. Not only that, we've been drilling grinding up the rock, analyzing it with a mass spectrometer. Uh, the question came up about sample return. Uh, we have a mass spectrometer, a gas chromatograph. We know what the soil is like, the wind-blown soil. We know what the composition of Mars is. We know what the chlorates are. Uh, and amazingly, you know, that we have found in the mineralogy all of the elements of things that we need for biology. Certainly we know about water on Mars. That's been an old story. Uh, we now know more about that. We know that deuterium to hydrogen ratio, so we know about the loss of water on Mars, but we're seeing all the key ingredients for life, the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. And some of those ingredients, nitrogen in the atmosphere, small percentage is really key uh, as it's a resource we can use uh, going forward. Uh, also, if you look at all of those elements, phosphorus, for instance, nitrogen, if you want to grow plants on Mars, it's all there. Uh, probably need a greenhouse. More interestingly, we're also seeing organics, and it's not everywhere. When we go into some of the mudstones at these river deltas, we're seeing signs of uh, chlorinated benzene molecules. Now, this is not you know, necessarily a sign of life. We see these kind of carbon rings uh, and chlorobenzene you know, throughout the universe. We see them in molecular clouds. We see them in meteorites. You know, this is a very stable carbon molecule. But we wouldn't necessarily expect to see more complex molecules because radiation breaks it down, time breaks it down, radiation and perchlorates accelerates the breakdown of organic molecules. But still, this is incredibly interesting that as we drive along, you know, we don't really see organics until we get to this one spot in Cumberland, and all of a sudden we see a concentration of organics. Uh, very exciting. And we also see other things that we're still working on, uh, you know, that may be even more interesting. You know, the water story. Uh, you know, we know about water all over, not only the polar caps that we've known about for, you know, decades, many decades of carbon dioxide ice and water ice, but water trapped in, uh, you know, the molecular matrix, water in ice, uh, water in humidity on Mars. Uh, and so this is a, uh, a Joe Heller cartoon saying the chances of finding life on Mars have increased with the discovery of flowing water. Flowing water, salty, briny water in these recurrent slope lineae. And here's the annual Red Planet Ice Carving Contest. But in fact, from the gamma ray observations from Mars Odyssey, gamma ray spectrometer, you know, we know that there's subsurface ice you know, all over Mars. It's just a different depth. And uh, one of the things we need to learn is where is it precisely? Down to meter scale. How deep is it? You know, helping us to decide where to go. And this water story only makes the question of is there life beyond Earth and our ability to find it on Mars even more interesting. Um, I also say that Mars is habitable for humans today. Uh, this is a picture of a NASA team I led on uh, Denali, uh, formerly Mount McKinley, and we routinely had temperatures for days of minus 40 C. Uh, I felt very comfortable. Uh, put on a jacket if you're cold. Well, in a spacesuit, uh, in a spacesuit on Mars, you're going to be hot. Minus 80 doesn't scare me a bit. Minus 200 doesn't scare me a bit. Uh, you know, that's all extremely manageable. Uh, and the pace of human discovery uh, will dramatically accelerate once we have humans in place and the ability to bring instruments, the kind of instruments we have on Earth. But more importantly, that human mind, uh, the human hands, uh, you know, mens et manus to Mars, just like we do on Earth. Uh, it 
It's going to make all the difference. We heard about the Steve Squires quote of, you know, everything we do, you know, in a day on Mars can be done in a few minutes uh, by, uh, with our rovers, can be done in a few minutes. It's absolutely true. And actually, if you scale the scientific return with the cost, it turns out that humans and robots, you know, are about the same cost. You know, if it costs you a billion dollars to get a rover to the surface and a hundred billion to get humans, the humans are more than a hundred times more productive. Now, there are a few issues. Uh, we definitely need to deal with planetary protection. Uh, the, the mission I did on Denali, our expedition was called Olympus Mons 2004 Denali Expedition. Uh, we wanted to be comfortable, so I brought this uh, biomass depository uh, device. Um, when humans go to Mars, uh, it's, well, when you're sitting on ice, it makes a big difference. Uh, and it's fun to build things. Um, but it really will fundamentally change our posture on planetary protection, and that's something we need to, to work on now. This is our current plan uh, for the robotic missions to Mars. We started with follow the water, then to explore hab habitability, and of course we've determined Mars was habitable. Now we're seeking for signs of life. And we have this amazing Curiosity rover that's still running. Opportunity is still going. Uh, after more than a decade, 12 years, Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you know, they're a little long in the tooth, but they're still continuing. We've just gotten the MAVEN spacecraft to Mars a couple of years ago. It's doing fantastic. Uh, India is now a player with their MOM mission, Mars Orbiter mission. The Trace Gas Orbiter from uh, European Space Agency and Russian Space Agency is on its way. That also includes a demonstrator module to go to the surface. Uh, InSight, our single point geophysical monitoring station, will land in 2018. Uh, it's delayed two years. And then in the 2020s, we have the United Arab Emirates. We have ExoMars rover from ESA and Russian Space Agency and our Mars 2020 science rover. You know, enormous capability, much more advanced than anything we've put forward in the, in the past. Mars 2020 is also an example of something where we've combined space technology, human spaceflight, and our science experiments uh, together. And in particular, the MOXIE instrument, which is going to take carbon dioxide in and then produce oxygen from it, our first in-situ resource utilization demonstration on the surface of Mars, and it's going to cache samples for later return to planet Earth. Not that that's required before we send humans to Mars, but getting those samples back will give us enormous leverage in understanding the science and hopefully uh, the habitability and existence of past life. One of the experiments we have on Mars 2020 is called the RIMFAX instrument. It comes from Norway. Uh, and this was something that we added to the mission to enhance not only the science, but our understanding of what's below the surface. And for the first time, we're going to have a ground penetrating imaging radar that's going to be able to map out the subsurface of Mars that will tell us about the structure, which is so important for geologists, but also possibly the existence of aquifers or ice. Underneath. Ice is very reflective. If we see ice underneath, you know, that's a potential resource and really is a game changer for human exploration also for science and the search for life. Uh, because it's a Norwegian instrument, I couldn't help uh, bring a quote from uh, Fritjof Nansen. Uh, the difficult is what takes a little time. The impossible is what takes a little longer. And Nansen is you know, a very famous polar explorer uh, and a very successful one. Uh, and you know, his uh, philosophy and many of the Scandinavian explorers is kind of the less is more. You know, that if you make it too grand, you never get to go. Uh, and there's, uh, these explorers had an enormous tolerance for adversity. And I think that's a quality that we'll need in, in future Mars explorers, at least, you know, the first ones to go. Uh, if we make things too grand and too big, you know, no government, no collection of governments will be able to afford to go. And so uh, I, I have a lot of respect for those polar explorers. So again, this is the picture of what we have going forward, but there's a piece missing. Now, what's after those rovers? Anytime you have a big campaign, military campaign or science campaign, you need overhead imaging and you need communications. Uh, we're going to need that at Mars in the 2020s. We're going to need higher resolution imaging. We want to map the whole planet uh, in uh, radio frequency waves that will give us the location of undersurface ice, uh, not just to square kilometers, but down to meter scale. We can do that from orbit. Uh, we're going to need high bandwidth comm for whatever we send to the surface. Most of what happens on Mars stays on Mars today because we don't have the bandwidth. Uh, we've even put out a request for information to see if there's commercial companies that want to provide the comm and we'll buy it at the cost of, of the data. And we've gotten a number of responses for that. We have an RFP out now uh, for a comm satellite. 
uh, and imaging as well for people who might want to participate. So we're looking forward to planning that next decade. If we think we want to get humans to the surface in the 2030s, uh, we should probably do a round trip demonstration at some point during the 2020s robotically. Uh, that's both a technology precursor, um, but also would do great science if it picked up the samples we've, we've collected and bring them back. So it's both science and exploration. Of course, we're all familiar with the squid picture. I think every NASA presenter has, uh, has shown this. Uh, and this is trying to lay out what those next decades will be like. I really believe that the ISS as a Mars mission simulator is absolutely key. You know, I said this when I was NASA chief scientist, and it was 2015 when we were in an end station. I said, we don't want to stand on the shores of 2015, look back and say, too bad we wasted that opportunity. You know, we're good now till hopefully 2024. There are a lot of things we need to demonstrate, and the station is the perfect place to do it. It's an international collaboration. You know, we've heard this talked a lot. It's the most amazing thing that we've been able to take all of these countries put together a collaboration that has survived the test of time, 15 years of, of people on station, the largest assembly project we, and most amazing engineering project ever in space. Uh, and it's working, and it's still working, and it will work into the early 20s. Uh, this is clearly a way of going forward. But international collaboration is, I think, key for a different reason. When we go to Mars, uh, you know, the US could probably lead it. We could probably go there on our own. It would probably be cheaper and faster to do it that way, but it would miss the whole point uh, that we're one species on one planet going to another planet. And I believe that's the perspective we need. And that diversity of ideas and diversity of, of countries uh, that will bring everything to bear will actually make it much more meaningful and, and long-term survivable uh, than just trying to do an Apollo-style sprint effort. Uh, I looked a lot happier in that picture than I do in my headquarters suit. I believe going to the surface uh, really needs to be the focus. All the action is on the surface. That's where we want to get. And if we spend too much time thinking about you know, going to other places, doing other things, we'll still get to Mars, but it, it'll add decades to the mission. I think it has to be a focus. Uh, and this is just an amazing picture of that Curiosity took of a dust devil uh, moving across the surface. Pretty amazing. Well, how do we get there? You know, that's the big question. Well. Big questions need big answers. Of course, Space Launch System is making great progress. We've seen that. Uh, and heavy lift does make a difference. You know, it changes the equation. And you know, we're making great progress on that. The Space Launch System is also a very versatile system in that it could launch, say, a mission to Europa to find out whether, uh, by flying through the plumes and analyzing the surface, whether there's organics uh, in the plumes, whether there's silicates, whether there's signs that there could be life in the ocean. Uh, of course, it launches Orion, could launch a Mars lander, could launch a transformational telescope that could look at the atmosphere planets around nearby stars and look for signs of pollution, you know, industrial pollution. I mean, if we see industrial pollution in a planet around a nearby star, we know we're not alone in the universe. Sadly, we can rule out intelligent life, but we know there's life out there. <laughs> you know, many other missions are possible with this system. We, uh, just in the last panel, we were talking about, you know, private companies, uh, you know, public-private partnerships with uh, NASA and SpaceX for Red Dragon. You know, who knows what the future will bring? But we have a long way to go. Uh, it's still a hard road. Um, if it's an impossible problem, it's going to take a little longer. I actually don't think it's an impossible problem. We studied the heck out of it. Uh, Andrea showed this chart yesterday. You know, we've been doing this over and over again. I think, you know, and if Doug Cook is in here somewhere, I saw him earlier. You know, I think I've been on three different of these studies with Doug Cook, and, and Brett Drake is here. I think he's been on every one. I think in the cradle he was doing his first study. Um, you know, well, you know, and this only goes back to 1980, so, you know, he was in elementary school. But, uh, but we do have 50 years of Mars exploration behind us. You know, the reason why companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic and others can build new rocket systems is because they're building on all that we've learned from, from 60 years of space flight. It's, it's amazing and it's a good thing. Uh, we started out with no data and just unknowns and we landed Viking uh, and we learned a lot about the surface and we orbited. You know, now we're working on what do we need to know for human exploration and we're quite far uh, to the right on that, what we need to know to get humans to the surface. There's more to know, but I think we're well on our way. Uh, I was really impressed uh, by Buzz's talk on Tuesday, and I think he got it right. Now, there's what Buzz said uh, in the front of the audience here, and it's what John heard. 
So this is what John heard. <laughs> we need consistent leadership. Without consistent leadership, you know, we're just going to go right, we're going to go left, we're never going to get there. We need NASA working as a team, not just as a team within NASA, but with all of our partners. We need a sustainable plan. We need a resilient and modular architecture. We need public support. We need high performance challenges. We have to ask our contractors. We have to ask our universities, our laboratories, our individual entrepreneurs. We have to ask them to do hard things. One, because that's what the task demands. And two, because that's the best benefit NASA has for the nation and the world. When we ask people to do these hard things, these high performance challenges, we get the best benefit. You know, that's really what I think the Apo Project Apollo showed us, what the shuttle showed us, what the Sp Hubble Space Telescope program has shown us, uh, what the International Space Station has shown us, is that's the benefit. We push companies to do things they've never done before. We push engineers, scientists to imagine things they wouldn't otherwise imagine, and that has enormous benefits. We have an incredible convergence now. Just look at the excitement in this, this conference, Humans to Mars. Look at the excitement around uh, the Martian all of the activities that are going on in the public sector, private space, commercial space. Uh, you know, we have a convergence of everything, congressional support. Uh, I think this is our time. We're having conferences about human landing sites where we get human spaceflight technologists and scientists together. You know, all of the elements of NASA, including Aero, to talk about, you know, flying helicopters on Mars, for instance. Believe it or not, that's possible. Uh, anyway, to, to, which are essentially drones on Mars. Uh, the FAA won't regulate those for a while. <laughs> Although as a pilot, I think that's a good thing. Um, but we're having those discussions, and it's great. It's causing great excitement. So here we are, uh, Curiosity's driving on Mars. We're having another Humans to Mars conference. But imagine the moment uh, when the first woman or first man steps foot on Mars. It's going to be phenomenal. this as many others probably will too. That was 2004. Uh, students from uh, the Pasadena School of Art made that in response to a contest for cool videos about Moon, Mars, and beyond. I couldn't find a way to edit that out to be politically correct. But the point is that this is a dream we've had for decades. This is a dream that Von Braun had. This is a dream that all of you, I presume, share. You wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, this is where we're going. So with that, I'll close and take time for questions. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. All right. Rob. biggest challenges that your predecessor will have in the next My successor? Quarter. Successor, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, yes. <laughs> you know, I think the biggest challenge that we still face, um, I think the biggest challenge that we face as a nation for Mars exploration is actually STEM education. You know, we have, uh, you know, people here, you know, who are scientists, engineers, artists, uh, reporters, but you're here because you have a love of science and engineering and space. Uh, we're focusing a lot on the next generation of scientists and engineers in this country. Or we could add STEAM and, and artists. Um, but almost all of that effort is aimed at about 1% of the population. And I think the biggest challenge that we're going to have to a long-term sustainable space program are the other 99% of Americans who are not getting an adequate science and math education. I think long-term, that's our biggest challenge. Short term for my successor, that's, that's a global challenge uh, and, and is somewhat unique to the United States amongst developed countries. 
but for, for NASA in particular, it's going to be to try and increase the collaboration between the directorates to have a, you know, a NASA Mars program versus a science Mars program and a human spaceflight exploration systems Mars program and space technology trying to navigate between those. I think, you know, the next uh, leadership at NASA, both whoever the next administrator is, the next associate administrator for science, you know, there's always turnover, deputy administrator, uh, and to extend to, you know, Buzz's comments, the next president is going to have to look at NASA and say, you know, Mars is, you know, our next stop, you know, we need to align things uh, for that. And it doesn't involve many changes, but it does add, you know, more collaboration, and I think that's good. I've worked pretty hard at it the last four years. I think that's the next step. Uh, you know, the other is, of course, always, you know, overall budget supporting supporting the budget because in science, you know, there are a lot of interesting things uh, we want to do and they're all very important. Um, the other threat, I think, to planetary exploration, either human or robotic, uh, and, and I use threat in, in a uh, somewhat tactical term, is that by the time we get to the 2020s, and this was discussed earlier in the conference, uh, the questions of climate change on planet Earth are no longer going to be in the realm of academic questions, and they're not today but the question of mitigation and adaptation are gonna be a much higher agenda for future Congresses and future administrations and, and everybody who lives on planet Earth. Uh, so anybody on space station is somewhat spared. Hopefully we'll have people on Mars, um, but on planet Earth we're gonna be dealing with that and that's gonna have budgetary impact, so that's another risk. Yes? So as a NASA employee, I'm bound by the rules of Congress, and right now we're prohibited from bilateral collaboration with China, and, and, and there are limits there. Um, but I'll go back to my statement earlier that I believe when, when we have humans set foot on Mars, it needs to be a planet Earth uh, endeavor, not just a United States endeavor. Um, and I'm a Pink Floyd fan, like I'm sure many of you are, and Dark Side of the Moon you know, is wonderful, but I will point out the far side of the moon is not the dark side of the moon. And if, you, if, you're, uh, if, if you're a space junkie as I am, uh, and I had the pleasure of, of helping NOAA uh, launch the Deep Space Climate Observatory, go to the uh, dscovr.nasa.gov website, and you can see the Earth from a million miles away. It has the Earth polychromatic imaging camera, and roughly every month you see the far side of the moon go by, uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, Buzz has, has seen that personally uh, you know, through panes of glass, but... Uh, uh, it, it's pretty exciting. But anyway, so that's my STEM education moment there, far side of the moon. Uh, but, you know, I, I think inevitably, you know, we're going to collaborate more internationally. Uh, as far as, you know, moon first, Mars first, you know, that has to be part of the plan. We are planning to operate in cislunar space. Uh, I've heard consistently from the European Space Agency, other space agencies, that they will follow us anywhere. We just need to lead. And I think that's a unique position we have in the United States, that we're regarded as the world's leaders in space exploration. And I think it's important we maintain that. Yes? So you, you, have, you have, for the most part, captured my philosophy, but keep in mind that I'm an astronaut. I'm a risk taker. 
Risk managers have a different perspective. Uh, and that's the reality of things. And Congress has a different perspective on the risk NASA should take than say even a NASA administrator might. Our NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden, is also an astronaut and our chief risk manager. Um, you know, so I, th I think we need to have more meat on the bone before we can really answer that. Sure. Okay, any last burning question? Okay, last burning question. If everybody gave one dollar, you could afford a third of a Mars rover. Uh, people actually give a lot more than one dollar. Uh, NASA is extraordinarily funded, and I believe that at you know 19 billion dollars a year plus, uh, there's a lot we can do, and there's a lot we are doing. Uh, it's, you know, it's pretty exciting. We do need to find a way, though, to enroll and engage the American public and the world public much more in our space program than we are. And so, if if there's a Great last question, if there's a carry home message and, and why you are all here at a Humans to Mars conference, not just to learn about what's going on, it's to learn and then advocate. Whether you're for Mars exploration or against Mars exploration, you know, take that message forward. That's my politically required statement. Um, but certainly, you, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to leaders of industry, talk to people who don't think about space, about why it's important, why it's interesting, and why it's worthy of our funding. Um, you know, there are lots of different models. Of, you know, I'm not sure that the funding is the main issue. I think it's those things that, you know, what John heard Buzz say are the major issues. So, again, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions that weren't answered. So, thank you. Thank you.